My name is Neil Redfern. I'm the Principal Inspector of Ancient Monuments for English Heritage in Yorkshire. Um, and for the last four or five years, I've been the activity lead in the NHPP for 2C1, which is Major Environmental <coughs> Threats. Um, I came from that uh, probably from two reasons. Um, as an inspector and lead in North Yorkshire, um, I have had to deal with the consequences of a single major environmental threat over a very large piece of landscape. Um, I tell you now, you don't ever want to go there. It's a complete nightmare. Uh, and secondly, I do live in a place that regularly suffers major environmental threats, and that is the city of York. It loves to flood. Okay? It's actually quite exciting, um, and it's done it for an awfully long time. Okay? So again, um, I'll be using some of my own experiences to, uh, to actually illustrate some of the points that I want to talk about. Um, when we started the activity team, one of the things that was really apparent is we didn't actually have any definition of which environmental threats we might be worried about. Okay? And um, to demonstrate this, one of my colleagues wanted us to use snow as a major environmental threat. Okay? They kept on telling me, oh, snow is really, really bad, it's really bad for buildings. I've had a building fall down because of snow. Um, it was very interesting, we talked around it and said, uh, why do you think it's bad? Oh, because the snow fell out and too heavy, it fell down. It turned out that the building was in shocking condition already. It had been empty for about 30 years, okay? It was actually not the snow, it was a trigger point, yes, but it was actually the condition of the building to start off with. So again, we really tried to look at uh, and understand those threats where we think we're most likely to have issues in, in the future. And we did this through getting Atkins, in a sense, to kind of <coughs> referee a conversation with us and to do some technical work looking at um, threats as a whole, the environment, uh, environment threats as a whole, and coming up um, uh, with, with some answers for us. And they did this two ways. They did an initial key messages report, um, which was, again, there was a whole series of workshops, there was a whole series of conversations. And then out of that, they did a much more in-depth technical report. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what the findings of their work was. And then, at the end of that, I'm going to add in my so what. OK? So fine, we know we're going to, I'm going to tell you about a whole series of threats, risk multipliers. But what does that all mean? OK? And uh, I'll be honest, when we get to the so what, uh, they are my thoughts. OK? Uh, they're not necessarily the organisation I work for or anyone else's thoughts, but this is actually where I've come to in this scenario. OK, so just a quick recap of where we've been in the past. These are some of the instances that we've actually had to deal with. Uh, this one here, this is Filing Dales. This is my own personal uh, Annus Horribilis. This was two and a half square um, kilometres of moorland going up in smoke. Um, we had something like 50 records on the historic environment record um, and 30 um, scheduled monuments, mainly rock art. Um, in the four days that it burnt afterwards, we actually enhanced the historic environment record by two and a half thousand other features. Okay? Um, the vegetation was to totally, totally stripped off. Utter nightmare. We'll come back to it. Uh, Bowcastle, um, Fountains Abbey, um, flash floods. Uh, Revo, um, 2005, this is a cracking one, I love this one, because it was the day my daughter was born, um, and uh, took out the English Heritage Visitor Centre at Revo, we'll come back to that, uh, a whole load of bridges on the River Rye were taken out, Cockermouth, you know, some really interesting issues there around people's perception of what bridges do in floods, um, and we could go on, uh, uh, the East Midland, uh, sorry, the West Midlands floods, uh, the hard last lot we've had in the southwest. Um, uh, uh, a winter ago. Um, so again, some of the background to, to these issues uh, I think we're all familiar with. I'm sorry. So what <coughs> Atkins actually came up with was a really, really important thing, is they didn't say it's just climate change and climate change and therefore. Okay? We've actually split what we're looking at into two things. We've split them into themes and risk multipliers. And the themes are quite straightforward. They are Coastal processes, inland water inundation, extremes of wetting and drying, fire, pests and diseases, and urban heat islands. And I'm going to talk more about those uh, individually. But then they've identified these two factors, <coughs> climate change and human actions. Interestingly, all those threats I've said previously, with possibly the exception of pests and diseases, have actually, we've, we've experienced them throughout human existence, 
in this country. Okay, uh, so it's it's they're not new. Okay, they've always been there. Wind, rain, flooding. It's always always happened. What we're seeing though is probably through changing climates is the predictability of them changing. They are becoming more uncertain. They are becoming more volatile. It is becoming less of a pattern we can say comfortably when things are actually going to happen. Okay? And so that is why we've identified climate change as a risk multiplier. Okay? It makes what was a problem just a bigger problem. Okay? And then the second one is human actions. And this comes out in two ways. Okay? It is the responses of people to the perception of climate change. Okay? And again, I put in here, this is a WEA, or Framework Directive. Okay? Climate change, trying to make our rivers more resilient. Uh, let's, get all, let's get rid of all the WEAs. Okay? And again, we will look at um, some of the impacts of, of the choice of, of humans as, as we actually go along. But again, human actions um, are a really critical aspect. But, um, again, they fall into this idea of, of, of risk multiplier. So it's actually what other people want to do to try and offset um, the, the perception of climate change and the risks of <coughs> Okay, so let's go through these um, six things in more detail. So coastal processes. Okay, the report goes into a lot of detail about these. And so basically you have erosion, that might be shoreline retreat, cliff erosion, salt marsh migration, or dune migration. And then you might have uh, um, also then additional issues around flooding. I'm not going to go into all the technical background about what these actually mean. This is just highlighting those issues that were actually flagged up in, in the report. The reports are incredibly detailed. They start at a macro level and then they work you right down into a micro coast, coastline level. So, for example, we start at UK wide um, with images, lots of mapping in here, so basically on different types of, of coastal erosion trying to actually plot densities of heritage assets. Uh, unfortunately, we can only go to the national statistics and national data sets, okay? Um, because we're trying to do it nationally. It's crude, because of course they're not, uh, you know, these are, these are random data sets. We, we haven't actually listed everything there as is to exist yet, so, um, uh, we, but we can only go what we want to go on. And then we move in, so this is at a, a regional scale, so this is the Suffolk, Norfolk coast, and then moving right down in, this is lower stock in Suffolk, Okay, so again, to actually start pulling apart what, what, what some of the issues are. Um, it then actually has quite a lot of um, statistical supporting information behind it as well, uh, if you want to get into it. So this is like a, a, a graph which has got length of coast, length of coast which is eroding and percentage. So cracking results in, in Yorkshire and Humber where I live, over half our coast is actively eroding. Uh, and when you actually see the maps, it's not just actively eroding, it's seriously actively eroding, you know, five metres plus per year and lots of stuff like that, um, which is quite exciting. So West Yorkshire that doesn't have a coast at the moment probably will do one day, which is quite exciting. Uh, oh, you meaning to, to, to where we, we sort of live. So again, lots and lots of supporting information in this. Inland water inundation. Again, um, the report goes in to try and break down the different types of scenario you might uh, want to consider. So we have fluvial or flash flooding of rivers. Um, we have high water velocity and high, um, high water level flow. And so what I'm talking about there is this sort of flooding. So interestingly, that's Fountains Abbey. Fountains Abbey doesn't exist on the flood risk maps because it's in a very, very um, narrow valley, uh, but it suffers uh, repetitive high energy flooding, okay, from, from flash flooding very, very quickly. <coughs> um, we then have fluvial surface water and groundwater flooding. Um, basically, it's where the land is just too wet, and water just starts rising up, drains, can't cope. Bizarrely, that's hull, okay? Hull doesn't flood for any other reason except that the groundwater level is such that actually if it rains too much, all of the water just seeps up from the ground, the drains can't actually cope. Uh, and then repeated low energy inundation. That's just regular big, big flooding, what that actually means. And again, we've been able to, to map this for you. So just through the, the flood zones and through groundwater susceptibility. Uh, so 
so really useful. And then again, in trying to say where in the country might this be um, most pertinent, we've tried to just do that statistical analysis of um, putting the, the designated assets next to uh, ne next to the next to these flood areas. I accept this is exceptionally crude. Part of the reason for doing this work was then to commission subsequent projects from the NHPP to address in more detail some of the issues raised in here. And you're actually going this afternoon going to hear from two of those projects that were commissioned as a result of this actual work. Okay, so this wasn't trying to answer everything. <coughs> Um, the, the third theme was extremes of wetting and drying. Um, <coughs> best illustrated, again, I'm using Yorkshire case studies, but Starkar. Okay, Starkar is probably the most important early Mesolithic site in the whole of northwestern Europe. Okay, well, frankly, it's buggered. Okay, and so we are now paying for the total excavation of it. Because it's never going to be preserved in situ. Okay, and that is because of fluctuating groundwater. Okay, it's not that it's drying out, it's actually that it dries and then gets wet again and then dries and then gets wet again. And the chemical processes that go on are rapidly degrading the material. And what's really, really uh, sad about Star Car is um, the wood, when you actually excavate it now, it's no longer wood. It's, it's, it's almost like a shadow image of wood, and as soon as you touch it, it turns into peat. Okay, so again, um, what you do with it is, is really problematic. <coughs> but this is where we also have to deal with issues again arising out of the groundwater um, framework directive, so pollution in our rivers. Again, this sort of activity is driving. This is a, a lead mining site, a, a lead smelting site in the Yorkshire Dales, where the dressing floor um, of the smelting process is where they crushed um, the lead and then started to actually process it. It's highly toxic. It's been washed away by the river, and obviously this is not particularly what the environment agency likes. And you can understand why, because heavy metal pollutants into our rivers are tend, tend to be a good idea. And then our uh, last one, just to highlight there, is um, upland peat management. Okay, so again, this is the North York Moors, and this is where uh, the red is moorland, and the black is blanket bog. And again, the huge drive to actually block the grips. The grips were created in the 19th and 20th centuries to try and dry the moors out to make them more appropriate for grouse management. Okay, but that's just meant the water gets into our watercourses more quickly, and we're trying to pull them all up now. Fire, as I mentioned, this is my own uh, personal experience. Um, it, uh, it is something that I think is going to happen more often. There are a whole uh, unique set of circumstances we'll, we'll come on to about it. Um, but given um, there have been statistics about how much, uh, how the percentage of historic environment records actually contained in our upland areas, these landscapes are really, really sensitive and really, really important. Okay? And um, vegetation management on them is absolutely critical. And if you lose that vegetation, you've got a serious problem. Pests and diseases. This is a really, really interesting one, um, and it's slightly my favourite one, and it's the one I think we should be most worried about. Um, this here, well, this is this is a graph showing different pests and diseases and when they came into the country. And I absolutely cannot pronounce the names of all these pests and diseases. I'm not even going to start. But this one here is Dutch elm disease, so in the 70s. So uh, this is when I was one year old. Okay, just so we all know where we're getting to. Um, and this is 1993, okay, so this is when I'm 22. And then since I was 22, in the last 20 years, we've gone like that, okay? The reason why I'm so particularly concerned about this one is if you lose a tree, you lose 200 years, potentially, of that thing establishing itself. It's not like necessarily like a building that you might be able to rebuild. To regrow a tree takes 200 years. You lose some of this significance for generations to actually come. And I think if we actually go and look back at some of the designed landscapes which lost their avenues through Dutch elm disease, you can actually see that. <coughs> they're, they're lost for whole generations. So I actually think pests and diseases might be the biggest transformational change in terms of the visual aspect of the significance of the historic environment that we can possibly imagine. And I just don't think we're there really on how critical that actually might be. Oh, sorry, wrong way. Um, and then a very specific one that's probably, this is an interesting one, but it's probably very London-focused. And uh, this is a band called Urban Heat Islands. 
Okay, and this is the fact that London as a mass, as a thing, is getting too hot. Okay, and um, this is a brilliant website. You can go on the London heat map, <coughs> and you can go on, and it'll uh, basically red is where it's really, really, really hot. Okay, and um, what does that mean? So, if temperatures rise, how long does London have left to actually be a place you can live in comfortably? Okay, it's going to be an issue at some point. And again, I'll come on to that. Okay, so very that's that's it really. That's how simple it was. Six themes, two risk multipliers. Okay, and again, when do we actually go with that? Well, that's what I'm just going to spend about five minutes on now, asking this question. So what? What does all that mean? Do we actually care? Okay. Well, the first thing is, um, I think we really, really, really need to understand um, with major environmental threats is that it's never one issue. It's always a combination of events that lead you to have a major environmental threat. And sometimes it's actually the threat and the, and the, the, the problem is the, the magnitude of it can be 30, 40 years in the making. All right? So this is Filing Dales Moor. So in September 2003, it caught fire. And it caught fire by someone throwing some rubbish away in the lay-by. OK? And within two days, it burned two and a half square kilometers. And it took a week. This is a week later, and it was still on fire. First really interesting thing is the fire itself was not the problem. OK? It, it actually really didn't damage much of the archaeology. A few, a, a few rock art panels actually suffered spalling from later freeze floor activities. But what really was the absolute nightmare was this, was the loss of the actual vegetation cover. Because uh, when you started going out there, what you actually realized that on one day what was happening with Filing Dales Moor is it was blowing away. It was literally blowing into the North Sea. This material was huge black dust clouds and you could just see hundreds of years of peat accumulation just blowing away. Okay? The next day you went there, you had a massive rainstorm, oh, sorry, a massive rainstorm it was washing away, okay? And actually, it was the problem of trying to control this extremely dynamic landscape that was created by the fire that was actually the biggest conservation nightmare, okay? And when we actually got into it, what was really fascinating is actually why, why was Hylendale so severe as a fire? Well, it turned out that there had been no active sheep management on this moorland since the Second World War, okay? And the landowner didn't believe in shooting. So this moorland had not been managed actively as a grouse moor for 30 years. That meant there was no prescribed burning. Okay? So the heather had not been controlled. And the fuel load of the heather was exceptionally high. You had heather that was six or seven meters long. Okay? When you normally go onto a moorland, heather's about this high. <coughs> That's because every four or five years they burn it off because the grouse don't like it. They don't like it too long. Okay? But it never happened here. And heather, when it's when it meters long, is really woody. Okay? And because the landscape hadn't been managed, that is why the fire ended up being so severe. There was enough fuel load there to get the fire into the peat and burn the peat. Okay? So it wasn't just 2003 that caused this problem. It was actually the land management from the previous 50 years that actually caused this problem. Okay? And then it was actually understanding, when you, when you get to there, where I've come to in this whole debate, Heather Moreland is absolutely critical for the historic environment. Okay? You do not want to lose Heather Moreland anywhere. Okay? Uh, fine. You might not find out what's underneath it if it's all there, but if you lose it, you'll have an absolute management nightmare. Okay? Uh, I do still think I'm the only person in what was English heritage to have bought £30,000 worth of grass seed. That's what it costs <laughs> to solve this problem. Okay? And I did actually have to go out, and I was standing, and I was watching that grass seed on one occasion blow into the North Sea, thinking, oh dear, now what do we do? But luckily, it all worked, and, and if you go to Pinedales more now, it's actually got its heather back again. Just over ten years later, in some sense, you wouldn't know this actually happened. But again, we had to almost physically stop the archaeologists wanting to look at the archaeology on this site, because actually what was more important was getting vegetation back on it. Inevitable loss, okay? If there's one thing I've learned here, we have to now deal with the fact of inevitable loss, 
we are going to lose things. It's impossible to keep some things. What we don't have, though, is a language for that. We don't have a philosophical framework for accepting this. Okay? This is Reculver Towers uh, on the Norfolk Suffolk coast. Okay? Uh, I personally see this as an, a wonderful opportunity to start being creative. We know it's going to fall down at some point. We probably can't afford the millions and millions of pounds to keep it. So how do we do something great with it? How do we work with the community to let them take it down? Maybe we move it. Maybe we let them build follies somewhere else out of it. Maybe we, I don't know, build a trebuchet and try and knock it down just for a bit of excitement, okay? The coast is going to do this to us. We're not going to keep this. But when you're dealing with cultural significance, cultural <laughs> significance isn't a static thing. It's a creative thing. We can go and create new cultural values. If we just sit around going, oh no, we're going to lose it, I personally think we're doing greater damage than the actual loss process. There's loads of things we can actually do here. This is an even more exciting one, because this is with me. And what? This is the graveyard of the church. Oh, God, what could you do with the idea of Dracula in this scenario? <laughs> okay. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to be flippant. The whole churchyard is literally falling into the sea. A real nightmare. But at some point, the church is going to go. It's a beautiful, beautiful church. What are we going to do about that? Okay. Well, personally, I think you could, have, you, could, you could feel sad or you could just enter into a most amazing creative response to this. And, and again, how do we actually do that? And I think in terms of buildings archaeology, you've got a real role here about how you actually turn this into a creative response. What can you do around, around that? And this is just uh, to highlight just the severity of the issue. This is uh, the five metre erosion is the East Riding Coast. Uh, so that was the uh, monument at the time of scheduling. And this is it now. So we're, we're about back here now. Okay, no one's recording that. No one's doing any archaeology on that. Yes, we've had the rapid coastal zone assessment. Fantastic, absolutely. We all know it's falling into the sea. Now what do we do? Well, nothing else. Doing anything, to be honest. And I just don't think that's an, a really a terribly intelligent response. Star Carp. So this is a photograph from the, from the 1980s. This is Star Carp now. And, and it looks lovely, doesn't it? You can't pick any of those pieces of wood up because they're not actually wood anymore. They have no woody material left in it. It's extraordinary. It's a, sh it's, it's a shadow image. Uh, still deeply, deeply exciting. Absolutely fantastic. But quite frankly, I just think this demonstrates preservation in situ is an absolute fallacy. We cannot guarantee we're actually doing it. I just believe it's, it's, it's now an outdated response to the issues. Okay? All right? And I think this really drives this whole issue around what we, how we respond to climate change. Drives us needing to address some of our fundamental points of where we've been over the last 20 years. And again, because I just don't think some of them are going to hold true for the next 20 to 30 years. But I see that as a real great opportunity for actually addressing how we do that. Um, a lot of what we've got to do is counterintuitive. This is a London heat island uh, map again. And I come back to this really importantly because you see these two these wells here of lightness. They're the historic royal parks. Okay? Our historic royal parks in London are cooling wells. They're reservoirs of coolness. Okay? <laughs> Alright? We've got to think counterintuitively. We've got to understand resilience, which I think is really important, which as a sector we just don't do. Okay, so in the next drought in London, we should go to the authorities and say, please don't stop watering the plants and the trees and the vegetation in London, because actually it's keeping you all alive. Okay? It is the thing that's keeping London habitable and livable in. Okay? But are we doing that? That's a that's completely different change, because the human response is to stop watering the trees and the plants and the vegetation and give the water to the human beings. Okay? So again, I think this is really important. We've got to think counterintuitively about uh, these issues. And again, resilience. Okay, I think this is a really, really critical thing. All these photographs are taken from York within 10 minutes of each other. Okay, in June last year, I was walking through York and it started raining. And I could you not, it didn't just start raining. Okay, it absolutely bucketed it down. And these are examples, this is, this is what it looked like. I mean, my, I just whipped the phone out and started taking photographs. 
you just couldn't move, the wall of water was in front of you. And these are images of every single drain that failed, drain pipe, dam pipe that failed. Okay? The reason why they failed is they weren't built for the volume of water that was actually coming down. Resilience, to my mind, is making sure that our rainwater goods like this aren't building do the job they need to do. And I'm sorry, we've now moved to a scenario where they don't do that. I don't call this adaptation. I don't call this retrofitting. I think that is language that makes it hard for us to understand what we've got to do, because it's so negative. Oh, it's the last thing we've got to do is retrofit something. Oh, adaptation is such a bad thing. This is resilience. We want to make the best of what we got fit for purpose to be around for a few people. I think it's a much better language, personally. Um, we've also got to learn, really, from how we looked after the landscape in, in the past. Um, this is Revo, absolutely fantastic place. Um, if you go there, just, just be aware, what you're actually looking at is what the Ministry of Works created in the 1930s. It's, it's not actually what Revo used to look like. And um, just to show you this, do you see this building here? Um, this is this farmhouse. Okay. Ministry of Works took it down in the 1960s. And the reason why they took it down in the 1960s is it got in the way of telling you the story about the monastic settlement there. Okay. It was bad heritage um, because it was, a, um, it was a later farm. We don't like that sort of thing on historic properties because it's confusing to everyone. So good idea. Let's take this wonderful roof structure down. Okay, so what then happens? English Heritage in the 1980s don't have anywhere to have a visitor centre, so they build a brand new purpose visitor centre just in that clump of trees there. What happens two years ago, three years ago? Well, of course, it all floods, doesn't it? And suddenly their visitor centre is completely flooded. What they need now is a bigger visitor centre. Of course, and they come in, suddenly realise, oh, they're in the middle of a flood zone. How are we actually going to do that? What are the implications of actually doing that? where if you actually look where the farmhouse was, which was just there, <laughs> oh, well, it never flooded. Okay? There's an awful lot we can learn from some of these things about where we actually, where we actually put things and what we actually do. Um, and then finally, my last point here um, is we can solve almost all problems by good design. Okay? Um, and this is, I think, somewhere where we've got a lot more work to do. Um, we are in the design world when we're looking at buildings and we're looking at our planning <coughs> heritage. How you integrate new things into those landscapes all comes down to design. And what's really interesting is um, we haven't done anything about how we help people like the Environment Agency design good flood defences, design um, good um, responses to the Water Framework Directive. Um, this is actually Saltaire, World Heritage Site. Okay, and this is the uh, original weir at Saltaire, and this is the proposal for a new hydroelectric power station on the weir. Okay, um, when this first came to us, it let's say it just didn't look like this. It, it just really didn't. Okay, and it's, again, it's not the principle all the time about these things. It's actually how you execute them, and we need to have a much better conversation actually about that, uh, which I, we think is absolutely fantastic now. Um, it's next to a registered park as well, although, I mean, really interesting though, the, the one complaint we're having about this now is people have concerned <coughs> that this little power station is going to create noise, which is really quite extraordinary given what the weird is there to actually do. <laughs> 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 a large mill, that wall's actually there, and part of its significance is actually it's a noisy environment. 